uh, unless you live in a cave and never turn on a TV, you, you know that homelessness is an important issue locally, uh, regionally, nationally. Uh, you can't pick up the San Francisco Chronicle without seeing something significant about which is homelessness in the city of San Francisco. Uh, I get news blasts from the LA Times, and uh, the LA Times uh, newspaper just did a massive six editorial uh, presentation about homelessness in the city of Los Angeles. So it's it's obviously uh, not a new issue. It's it's not. Uh, localized to any particular area. We in Berlin are not immune from the issue. And um, the good news is that we've got some very good minds working on the issue. And uh, we have three of them that we are fortunate to be able to listen to today to hear their presentation on the topic. And I'm, I'm very pleased to see this large of a group uh, to come out and hear about this challenging topic, which is not necessarily everyone's favorite topic to discuss. Uh, we begin with Andrew Henning. Andrew moved to San Jose, California in the summer of 2010 through the AmeriCorps VISTA program for a position as the Project Homeless Connect Coordinator for the Santa Clara County. He hosted 13 homeless resource fairs from Palo Alto to Gilroy and then took a position with the downtown streets team in Santa Clara County, working first as the employment developer and later the manager of employment services. He then moved to Marin County in 2013 to launch, to launch the downtown streets team, first team outside of Santa Clara County in this area. Since 2016, he has been the City of Santa Rafael direct, Director of Homeless Planning and Outreach, where he's responsible for creating and implementing the city's strategy for addressing homelessness. Andrew lives in Berkeley with his wife, Joanne, who is the vice principal at a charter school in Richmond. He recently received his MBA from UC Berkeley. Uh, I'll introduce all the speakers, and then we can hear them one at a time. Christine Paquette is the executive director for the St. Vincent de Paul Society of Marin County, where she's held management positions for the past 12 years. Before becoming the executive director, Christine spent 14 years in nonprofit development on the East and West Coasts. She's a member of Marin's Homeless Policy Steering Committee and is on the board of the Marin Interagency Disaster Coalition. She's taught nonprofit management seminars at UC Berkeley and Dominican <coughs> University and has served on the development board for the National St. Vincent de Paul Society. A Tiburon native and graduate of Redwood High School, in UC Berkeley, she currently resides in downtown San Rafael. And uh, last but not least, Ashley Hart McIntyre serves as the Homeless Policy Analyst with the Marin County Health and Human Services Department. Since 2008, she's worked with communities across California and in the, count, in the, in the country generally to develop and implement solutions to homelessness. In Marin, she, her work is focused on uh, working across agency lines to improve access to housing and services, implement best practices, and prioritize for assistance to those with the highest need. She holds a law degree from the Hastings College of Law at the University of California, but she describes her primary passion as social justice policy work. Ashley lives in San Rafael with her husband, Chris, and their 13-month-old son, Philip. Uh, we will begin with Andrew, and uh, I'm going to let him just go ahead and pass the mic as, as our speakers see fit. Uh, they've, they've done this presentation, and I, I think they have their own uh, idea of how best to do it. And so here we go without further ado, Andrew Henning. Thank you. We were joking that our uh, bosses are here, so make sure you applaud extra loudly. <laughs> <laughs> um, so again, I'm Andrew Henning with the City of San Rafael, and uh, today we're going to talk about homelessness in Marin and a lot of the strategic and tactical things that we're doing to address it. So we'd like to start these presentations by first starting with a very simple question that we often forget to ask ourselves, which is this. What would you do if you became homeless? And if you're struggling to answer this question, ask yourself this. If you were traveling through space and you encountered a black hole, what would you do? The answer to both is the same. You would try to avoid it at all costs. What we're finding across the country is that up to 70% of people that become homeless are actually able to self-resolve their homelessness in a relatively short period of time. Uh, and so the question for us really as policymakers and as 
Nonprofits can only give to the folks they can. So uh, what we're finding is that it's really this interconnected web of issues that people are facing. It's not just housing, it's a job loss, it's health issues, it's mental health challenges, it's the erosion of a social support network. It's all of these things together that are causing homelessness. It's never just one thing. And so if you were to look at this in terms of people that become temporarily homeless, uh, or people that are homeless for much longer, people that are chronically homeless, so this is people that are homeless for a year or longer, uh, and have some sort of disabling challenge, you can see from a community perspective the costs rise exponentially for people to be on the street. So some studies have found that it can cost $60,000 a year or more in public services for someone to be unhoused in our communities. So we also see that this trend holds for community concerns and community complaints. It rises exponentially into this chronically homeless group. And then also in terms of just ethically the vulnerability of these folks, these are the most vulnerable people in our community. Folks that are chronically homeless pass away 20 years earlier than their housed peers from preventable chronic illnesses. So this is a real challenge on many fronts. And so really what we're finding is that 80% of our challenges from homelessness are really stemming from just 20% of the homeless community. And so with that as sort of our core insight of how our system has started to change over the past two years, uh, it really prompts the question of what's been going wrong. Uh, and part of it is that historically, and this isn't just in Marin or San Rafael, I think it's across the whole country, a lot of the focus on homelessness, uh, you know, from the public to funders to a lot of different folks, is on this part of the curve. So the hardest to serve folks are not ending up uh, getting the services that they need. Uh, and part of this is just, it happened organically over time. So really modern homelessness, and we can go into this in more detail in the Q&A, but you know, modern homelessness really did begin in the early 1980s. And so there's was a lot of different macroeconomic forces that were driving folks um, to the street and the federal government wasn't involved in the issue. And so communities sort of cobbled together a response over the ensuing 40 years. And so, this is a map of our system of care in Marin, and as you can see, Howard Schwartz, who works with Christine at St. Vincent's, he has a PhD, he can't even navigate the system. Why would we expect someone that's addicted to methamphetamine and has a traumatic brain injury to do any better? So part of what's going on is that we have two cycles that are uh, causing chronic homelessness to really uh, continue and be a real challenge for us. Uh, the first is that you have a group of people that are inherently difficult to serve because of the challenges that they're dealing with. Unfortunately, a lot of times we set up programs that have barriers, even if it's a small barrier like sobriety or attendance or having a phone to call to make an appointment. People fail out of these programs, they become distrustful of the system, they don't seek help, and then they actually get worse. And so you can see this visual, vicious cycle repeating over time for really high needs folks. And then unfortunately, at the same time, you have a longitudinal bias in terms of homelessness. So the longer that you're homeless, the better you become at being homeless. So you can imagine that if you became homeless and you fought really hard and you couldn't get out of a unit up on the street, eventually you would begin to find other people that are experiencing homelessness, you would begin to adapt your lifestyle, you would begin to normalize with a very abnormal experience, and then you enter into survival mode. So some people like to say, oh, well, homelessness is a choice. I think any of us can tell you it's not a choice. I think some people are just so much in survival mode that they're not thinking about what am I gonna be doing a month from now. They're thinking about what am I gonna be doing three hours from now to sleep tonight. And so part of our challenge in terms of outreach and service provision uh, is working with folks and building those relationships. So fortunately, that's the challenge, that's the baseline. Uh, so I'm gonna turn it over to Ashley to talk a little bit about what we've been doing as a community to shift uh, our approach and how we're uh, starting to have some really great results. Thank you, Andrew, and thank you to all of you for coming here to hear what the exciting things are happening at Homeless Nest Bar. All right, so picture this. You have a broken arm, and you go to the emergency room, and you are necessarily going to have to wait for a little while. You're going to sit there for a couple of hours, and somebody else, or maybe a number of people come in, and they're seen more quickly than you. Maybe there's a gunshot wound or a heart attack or whatever it may be. And even though you really would like some attention because you're sitting there with a painful broken arm, nobody is disputing that the person who has a heart attack should probably be seen first in a life-threatening condition. And your broken arm can probably wait a little bit longer. We're starting to look at our homeless system of care in a similar fashion. So we have uh, a whole group of people who are experiencing homelessness in our community, and they have a wide variety of different needs. 
Some of them are very vulnerable. Others are maybe a little bit less vulnerable. All of them deserve some kind of attention. Everybody needs some assistance. But uh, we are working to make sure that the people who are actually at risk of dying because of their lack of housing uh, receive the, the attention first. So the way we do that, um, we're looking at a number of different factors to help figure out who's most vulnerable. The VI for that is a terrible acronym for an assessment that we're using to help us. <laughs> Don't even worry about what it means, it doesn't matter. Um, but it, uh, it's, it's one of the tools we're using to help determine who is uh, vulnerable here at Marin. It's a tool that uh, has been rolled out across the country. Um, the vast majority of communities that are uh, implementing this system, which I think I forgot to mention, is called Coordinated Entry. Um, it's, a, it's federally mandated, so communities across the country, communities across Canada also are implementing coordinated entry systems. Um, and we know it really actually works. Uh, and most communities are actually using the same tool that we're using. So it gives people a score from 1 to 17. 17 is the, um, the highest score you can receive. And uh, scores between um, eight or 10 and 17 are appropriate for long-term housing supports with uh, attached services, we call that permanent supportive housing. So we uh, ha are working to assess as many people as possible who are experiencing homelessness in Marin. Um, and we have a, a pool of folks with scores. We filter everybody who is uh, appropriate for permanent supportive housing, everybody who has a score of 10 or higher. Um, and that's the pool that we're working with is coordinated entry right now. Um, eventually we may expand that to people who have a uh, few more needs, but right now this is what we're working with. And then uh, we create a by name list and we uh, rank order that list based on people's scores. So the person with the 16 gets served before the person with the 10, even if the person with the 10 has been homeless a lot longer or was assessed first. So the people who have a lower score, below uh, eight or 10, are referred to different kinds of interventions. Um, there are people who are gonna need maybe some short-term rental assistance with some case management, but will probably be all right after a year or two. Um, or maybe just need some connection to uh, friends and family in another community, or um, a repair of a relationship with moms. So you can sleep on their couch, that kind of thing. The population that we're talking about here, the people who are scoring 10 or above, are folks who have disabilities we're really going to not be able to maintain independent housing in the long term, or may need many years of support in order to become independent. So we take our by name list, and we um, match people from the top of the list with the available housing opportunities. So this sounds very simple, it's actually a pretty big and exciting thing because this requires our homeless programs during our right to give up all of the authority over who comes into their own programs. Uh, people are, uh, as beds become available, as openings become available in our homeless programs, they're required to notify the coordinated entry program and um, the person from the top of the community-wide list goes into that first bed. Like that. Uh, and then we do it again with the next person on the list. We work our way down the list until um, everyone is housed. But we do adjust that list as needed. So you might imagine um, that uh, as we are assessing more and more people, please, because we certainly don't have assessments for every single person who comes to Marin, we're working on it, but it's a, it's a process, that we might uh, encounter somebody who has a higher score than some of the people who've been on the list for a while. So our list uh, is adjustable. Uh, it's dynamic in that fashion. So here you see We've got a, a 12 on the list, and then that 11 looks like they're going to be the next person housed, but oh, look at that, we got a 15 um, just assessed, and that 15 is going to get housed before the 11. And we continue to do this until we um, are all done with our, our list. Yeah, so we are, um, see, and I'm going to let you talk about that after, by the way. Sorry, we got our slides a little bit mixed up here. Um, so, okay, uh, one thing I, I also wanted to share with you um, related to coordinated entry is that we have a new program in Marin called Whole Person Care. Um, 
is part of the California's uh, 1115 Medicaid waiver program, which basically allows uh, communities to spend Medicaid money on things that Medicaid won't usually pay for. Um, and that would include, uh, particularly in our case, case management for people who are experiencing homelessness. It includes, um, we're also doing some security deposits and moving costs for people who are homeless. It's a recognition of the fact that uh, people's needs are, um, people's medical needs are influenced by more than just their medical conditions. Um, and that it's, as Andrew mentioned before, people who are homeless die 20 years sooner than their house counterparts. Um, housing is, in fact, a medical intervention in many cases. There's increasing amounts of evidence to support that. So we have, um, we are just implementing a pilot program in Marin to um, launch whole person care. We're working right now with a collaborative of St. Vincent de Paul, Litter Center, and Marin Housing Authority to implement housing-based case management for our super high needs, medically vulnerable people experiencing homelessness. Um, and those, uh, that case management service is paired with vouchers from the housing authority. So we have um, a significant number of uh, new housing plots with appropriate services for people who are experiencing homelessness here. Uh, and that's, that's pretty exciting. We have a few um, underlying principles of whole person care that also apply to um, coordinated entry. And the principle among that is uh, housing first. And housing first is a philosophy that says that people should be, uh, all persons are housing ready. There should be no preconditions to housing, like sobriety, uh, like minimum income, or a clean background check. Um, that people are much more able to address those issues once they're stably housed. And asking somebody who's experiencing um, some kind of psychosis and drug addiction to get sober and remember to take their medication on time uh, while they're on the streets is um, not practical. So there's, again, this is an uh, evidence-based practice implemented um, really worldwide, and there's, there's um, extensive evidence from all kinds of communities, not just big cities like San Francisco and Los Angeles, but from smaller rural, suburban um, communities also. We also are um, working to make sure that our practice is trauma-informed, so that we're sensitive to the needs of people who have experienced intense trauma, which many people who are experiencing homelessness have been through, uh, and that our um, Uh, that uh, we are addressing all of the different social determinants of health. So those different things that influence somebody's likelihood to die early that are beyond their uh, actual medical conditions. And that's housing, poverty, all things like that. <coughs> Sorry guys, I can see the, the fourth one. You think I would know off the top of my head, but... Oh, it's person-centered, of course. So everything that we're doing uh, needs to be centered around the person. All of our services are tailored to uh, each person's specific needs, um, and that uh, uh, everything is uh, responsive to the shifting needs over time um, that, that people have. So with that, I'm going to hand it over to Christine, and she'll share with you our HOT program, which is the precursor to our coordinated entry. everyone, thanks for coming today. Again, I'm Christine Heckett. I'm the director of the St. Vincent de Paul Society, which is down on B Street in San Rafael. And I'm here to talk to you about a more local component, a local reaction to our challenge of homelessness in Marin. Um, the previous programs that we talked about, the coordinated entry and whole person care are really important programs that stem from national and state sources. Um, but in addition, we all know we also have our local solutions that are really important and tailored to our own community. And that is HOTS, which is the Homeless Outreach Team, which is a, a, a program that's wrapping around this housing first concept, which is that people who are chronically homeless on our streets, they really need housing first. We can help them with their health issues, their addiction issues, their mental health issues, once they're housed. But if we're trying to solve those complex issues first, before they get into housing, they end up on our streets for a very long time. 
Um, hot, that those are some members of our hot team, so you can have some faces to what I'm talking about. Hot stemmed from another question that we asked um, at St. Vincent's, and that question was why? Why, if we have so many programs and so many solutions and so many people working on this problem, do we still, down on B Street, see the same folks day after day, and I know you see them too, day after day after day, in and out of our system, sometimes for decades? How can we address that? Why is that happening? And um, so what we did at St. Vincent's is we went down to San Mateo with Kate Collin and some others, um, and we looked at their HOT program, again, Homeless Outreach Team, who were doing a great job in a downtown area, much like San Rafael's, um, by taking one person at a time and deciding that person is no longer going to be homeless. We're going to solve homelessness. Let's just start with one person and see how our system works. So HOT looks like that. It's a bunch of people from community-based organizations like St. Vincent's and Ritter and Homeward Bound and others. It's the Public Guardian. It's County Health and Human Services, including mental health, um, drug and alcohol. It's the police department, the mental health officer. It's really all the people in the county that need to come together and not only solve this problem, but let's look at one person at a time and solve homelessness for them. And if we can do that, we can actually create a system that works. So when you saw that mishmash of all those agencies with Howard, our PhD, that, that project stemmed out of hot because we realized as we're trying to work with one person at a time, this was so confusing. We were trying to get one person at a time through the system. We couldn't do it. We didn't understand the rules, the regs. Why couldn't this person get an appointment? How come this wasn't working? Uh, that someone was trying to get a hold of them, well, the person doesn't have a phone. You know, we're dealing with people that are very limited in their ability to help themselves. We need to help them, and yet we didn't understand our own system. So when you see work like that, up on that screen would be the name of the person. And it's the feeling is we're gonna sit in this room until we solve this problem. And um, in about, it's been a little more than two years, from, from about January to October of the following year, we housed, housed permanent supportive housing, 24 people that otherwise would most definitely still be on the street. So we're really proud of that. Thank you to each other. Uh, we're really proud of that. And just to give you some context, you know, at St. Vincent's alone, we housed more than 65 homeless families last year. And we're really proud of that. And that's some really important work. But I can tell you that those 24 people were a lot more time and effort and challenge than families um, getting back on their feet. So that number means a lot to us. And we've gone from there and moved on to the coordinated entry system. So our numbers are now being merged with the coordinated entry numbers. But we're, we're down, to, we're serving a lot of people. And housing is the goal. Um, the other thing that happens in those meetings is accountability, which is super important. And in the past, a lot of us would meet together and be very stumped by this problem that we would see on the streets. And we would think, well, what's the solution? Housing, well, who's got housing? None of us. OK, let's go meet again in a month and talk about it again. And nothing <laughs> really got resolved if we were all waiting for housing to happen. So by all being in the room and actually taking those action items and say, OK, who's going to get filled to the Ritter Clinic tomorrow? Who's going to make sure that they get the housing authority? Who's going to get him through that paperwork? There was no sort of disappearing into the like, oh, one, someone should help fill one of these days. It was, we're meeting in two weeks and you better do your action items or it's gonna be awfully embarrassing to be sitting in front of your peers and saying, oh, I actually didn't get to that this week. So we found that by being together and supporting each other, but also holding each other accountable, things moved a lot faster. And then finally, as already addressed, we're able to actually change the system by understanding the system. So we were able to define, when we had barriers to helping people, what are federal rules and regulations? We're not gonna change those today. But what are our own local rules, our own program rules that were instituted 10 years ago, for some reason no one can remember, that are actually stopping people from getting their housing, okay? So if they have to sign this form or come on Tuesday at nine, do they really need to come on Tuesday at nine or can the person go out and meet them? You know, do they really need to show up at the appointment? Because I can tell you this lady is at fourth and eight 
every single day, and Andrew can tell you that too. Can you go find her? Because I don't think she's gonna be getting her stuff to you. So those changes have been really important. And because of that, we're housing more and more people faster and faster because we're loosening up a system that really didn't work for the people with the highest needs. Um, so just some outcomes here. We had one, one of our first hot clients um, was very well known by the San Rafael um, Fire Department. He was being transported sported to the ER on a very regular basis. Um, $30,000 a year in tax dollars spent on one individual back and forth from the street to the hospital. And we did get him housed. Um, and you can see what happened to the medical transport numbers. Guess what? When you house people and you're able to visit and offer them services in their home, they're not stuck using the ER in our jails. Um, please contact Again, for our first, these numbers are a while back now, but as we got started with HOT, we measured, well, how many police contacts uh, are, are happening with these folks. And as you can see, as we started housing people and addressing their needs, that went down drastically too. Um, yeah? Last So when they need medical care, they actually have case management in their home. So they have a case manager assigned to them. So that's part of the uh, permanent supportive housing, isn't just permanent housing, it's that you have a case manager that says, wow, you better get that thing checked, let's make an appointment at the clinic. Rather than they're on the street, it gets so bad that the only thing they can do is call an ambulance and get them to the emergency room. So that's a great question, and when Ashley talks about whole person care, even more support, um, more funding for even more support, because people need it. Uh, the other thing we learned is if you house people, wish them luck and walk away, they're gonna fall out of housing. So that's just something, a really important lesson for all of us, how, they, believe it or not, housing them turns out to be the easy part. Is keeping them housed. That's a lifelong challenge. That's our work. So, um, I believe. No, nope. I have one more slide, and that just says housing first. It's the answer. Um, this one: 80% of housing first individuals stay housed versus 30% uh, in treatment. That's a national statistic. Um, so, and, uh, you know, telling people to pull them up by them, their own bootstraps and get help for their problems is not as effective as helping them. And then 99% reduction in police contacts and 85% in medical costs, which we saw. So that's that's our basic local response um, that's working really well and we're proud of it. Thank you. So it's actually a perfect segue back to um, what Ashley mentioned earlier with the statistics. So I think one of the key things for us is really how do we convey this success to the community? So um, I'll just come back briefly and show you. Um, so basically what a lot of communities that are implementing coordinated entry have done is create what they're calling a community dashboard. So we officially launched coordinated entry on October 1st. And so the way that a lot of communities are tracking this is that if you have, let's say again, starting in October, you have, let's say, 200 people that are chronically homeless at that point in time. Moving forward every month, you should be able to report how many chronically homeless people you're housing through the HOP program and other efforts and then how many newly chronically homeless people are, are kind of falling into the this, in this system. And with that, you get a net number. And so you can see that Riverside County, using this methodology for veterans, they could actually track every single month their progress towards a term called functional zero, which is basically a place where you have housed everyone that's chronically homeless or every homeless veteran, and then moving forward, you're able to house people faster than they're becoming homeless, because again, Homelessness is caused by upstream intervention, so we're just trying to get people back in the house. So that red line is essentially sustainably ending homelessness. So we're, we're starting to get to the place where we can actually report this, have a community dashboard to track that progress, which is really exciting. So one of the questions is, if um, we have all these great things going on, how do people actually get into the system? So there are a lot of ways that we're addressing this, but one thing in particular that I wanted to touch on uh, is this idea of mobile services. So uh, we have a new program that actually just officially launched, I think it was last week, called Marin Mobile Care. Uh, and this idea really came from a, a problem that we were facing around showers. So showers seem like a pretty basic thing. What, what could be the challenge there? Uh, well, a couple things. First, uh, there are about 700 people that are unsheltered in Marin County, according to our last point in time count. 
the only dedicated shower resource for people that are experiencing homelessness was the showers at the Ritter Center. And so that means, given their capacity there, over or less than 20% of the people that were experiencing homelessness in Marin did not have access to regular dedicated hygiene services. The other challenge there is that 70% uh, of Marin's homeless community is actually outside of San Rafael. So I want to repeat that. 70% of Marin's homeless community is outside of San Rafael. So you have a dynamic where a lot of people are in need, but the dedicated service is not there to help them. Uh, and then of course the last point of this is really how do we make sure that people are not just using a service as a service, but it's really a gateway to housing and long-term uh, sustainability in their life. So when we looked around trying to figure out what are some uh, examples of uh, different approaches to this in other communities, uh, we found that um, throughout the country, mobile showers was a growing uh, best practice around trying to actually uh, tackle this issue of providing access uh, and meeting people where they are. So uh, around us, there's mobile showers in Sonoma, San Francisco, Santa Clara County, on the peninsula. Uh, there are programs in the Midwest, so in, in, uh, I think it's Kansas City where this one on the bottom left is. And then on the bottom right, there's a program in Florida. So this is being adopted all across the country. And really, the mobile shower idea offers a couple advantages. So number one, uh, they're actually pretty cheap. So the shower trailers are, are affordable, and it's easy to scale up and down based on how much demand is actually in the community. Uh, number two, um, they can actually go to where people are. So I know this from you know having you know worked as a uh, basic case manager myself, and having done outreach before working for the city, which is that some people you can imagine if you have no resources, your entire day might be trying to come up with money to get bus fare, to then go to another community to get a service, and then you have to sign up and wait, and then you have to go back, and th that's your day. You haven't accomplished anything towards finding employment or finding housing. So really, if we can get a service to where people are, it's efficient for them, uh, and it provides a better way for them to, um, you know, again, have, pursue their time in a better way. Um, the other thing with mobile showers is that it obviously reduces the amount of loitering or impact in any one area. They go in sort of in a surgical way for a couple hours and then they're gone. So you don't have these impacts of loitering or having long-term congregation in certain areas. And then most importantly for us is just the integration with this new coordinated entry system. So there are, again, like I said, there are a lot of people that are not homeless in San Rafael but are in other parts of the community that don't have regular access to our system of care. And so if we can actually get to those people we have a better way of getting people that are vulnerable on Richardson Bay or in Nevada or in West Marin into our system of care. So fortunately, uh, downtown streets team stepped up and um, said that they would actually manage and run this program. So this is some of our original concept art for what the shower units look like. And like I said last week, um, they have actually launched the program. This is Karen with downtown streets team at the unit. Um, and you can see that this is what the ac actual unit looks like in our community. This isn't just like, a sales picture, this is the real unit in our community. So, very exciting. Uh, and the great thing really has been, I think, that it's opened a platform for us to really engage, uh, at least from San Rafael's perspective, with other communities and cities and towns in Marin. So, for example, uh, we donated a pickup truck to the, the program. Karen, let's jump in. <laughs> um, and then the city of Larkspur donated another truck. Um, the capital cost for the actual shower units came from Marin Community Foundation. And then MCCMC, so the Marin County Council of Mayors and Council Members, good enough, Kate's nodding, so that works. Um, they actually um, set aside funding for the operations of the program. So that's a, um, that group has something called the Community Homeless Fund, which is all the cities and towns in Marin contributing funding to one pool of funding that now can go to a regional intervention like the shower. So across the board, it's a win-win-win for everyone. Um, the showers have uh, launched in San Rafael and in Novato. And then Ashley and Karen and I have been going and meeting with different jurisdictions, especially in kind of southern central Marin, uh, so Sausalito, Marin City, Larkspur, Fairfax, to try to get a southern rotation of shower shifts as well. So um, this is really coming along quite nicely. And again, it's one of the gateways that we have to try to get people into the coordinated entry system. Uh, and then long term, hopefully, this can really become a platform for adding other services as well. So especially with whole person care, increased medical, you can imagine that if you have a shower um, in a certain area, you could also pair that with nurse practitioners, with mental health practitioners, uh, with benefit registration. So really, again, providing all those services in a convenient way that people that need the help. So that brings us to the last uh, point, which none of this is uh, really worth anything if we're not getting people housing. Yeah. Oh, I was going to ask you, in terms of the mobile services, 
Yeah. If we encounter someone in the field or in the yeah. large church, yeah. how do we contact you or whoever is going to go meet them? Um, that's a good point. So at least in terms of the shower program, so... Oh, sorry. Um, the question was, if you encounter someone in another community that might want to engage with the showers, how would you refer them to it? Um, I believe the website is live, marinmobilecare.org. Um, so they have all the details about the program. They have the schedules on there. Um, Karen also, I think, has printed actual physical cards. So if people are, if you're seeing folks, she could probably get you the cards and then you can pass that to people of what the shower schedule is. Um, and then her email address is karen at streetsteam.org. And I'm happy to provide that afterwards. Yeah. Um, so again, um, the whole thing that we're doing here is trying to get people back into housing. So as long as if we're doing all these other things that we're not focused on housing, it's, it's kind of for naught. So the important piece here is that we're really focused on housing as well. And, and I'm excited to announce that we've really been trying to um, come at this in a new way uh, to really create more units for people that, that need them and they, obviously they're the demand. Um, so you'll remember the chart that I showed you earlier about all the different reasons that people are not able to, or that might end up on the street. This chart also applies to our sort of conventional approach to housing creation in our community. So um, I'll give you just one example in San Rafael. So right after I started, um, there was a, a property owner in San Rafael. He owns a commercial property. He approached the community about Basically, he wanted to sell his building, have it converted into residential, and then that would be new housing in the community for folks. Uh, and it took us almost two years to even just get that property properly evaluated, you can say. So part of that is because there's this very disjointed nature of housing creation in our community where there are all these different advocacy, advocacy groups, we have different nonprofits, we have our different policy makers, we have different funders, and there might be kind of bilateral conversations, but we're not really on the same page strategically overall. And so um, what we've been talking about is creating a, an effort that we're um, kind of terming at this point, opening doors Marin. And the idea here is really to create more of a centralized coordination function across all these different stakeholders around one strategy. So the vision is really uh, quarterback the creation of, of housing in Marin. And again, that's kind of the key word, quarterbacking. So it's really connecting the dots for people. It doesn't, need, doesn't mean we need to create some new infrastructure. It just means we need to collaborate better around opportunities. Um, and then the short-term mission, connecting back to coordinated entry, is we want to really establish a model by working to actually end chronic homelessness in our community. So create enough housing to end chronic homelessness in our community. Uh, and we believe, uh, we've been working together as a group, and this is again, electeds from across the county, um, city managers from across the county, um, private sector real estate folks, the faith-based community, our nonprofit partners, the county. Um, we're really working together to create a community business plan about how to do that. And I want to show you that this isn't just you know, an intellectual exercise. We've really broken down here. You can see our projection according to the 2017 Homeless Point in Time count is that there are about 350, uh, 360 people that are chronically homeless in our community when that was done. And so again, like the, the progress dashboard that I showed you earlier, you know, given that there's some inflow into homelessness, and hopefully over time we can reduce that through more upstream <coughs> intervention, but we've really laid out through this program um, ways to uh, different categories and channels for really getting people back into housing. So there's, uh, again, looking at commercial properties and seeing if we can convert them to residential. There's recruiting landlords. There's um, a term called diversion, where you're really trying to reconnect people with friends and family to see if they'll take someone in again, and, and maybe that's an option. Um, and then of course there's you know the tiny home movement, accessory dwelling units. So you can see that we've really tried to get specific with numbers around what is realistic to achieve in our community, uh, and we're trying to create working groups that are really responsible and accountable into each one of these uh, different housing channels. Uh, and so again, you can see where the projection comes from. We believe that if this is successful, in four years, we can end chronic homelessness in our community. So that's really exciting. Uh, communities across the country using coordinated entry, working on housing, are ending chronic homelessness, they're ending veteran homelessness. So you know we're no different. And, and a lot of the partners that we talk to that are outside of Marin, they really say it's a pretty manageable challenge here. I mean, if you think about Los Angeles County, there's 60,000 people that are uh, homeless in that community. 
um, that's more people than are in San Francisco. So um, this, you know, our 300 people, that's that's achievable. So uh, if we're really working together, we can get that done. So uh, with that, I think that concludes our formal presentation, and we'll do questions. All right, let's go and uh, start with some Thank you for that question. So the question is in response to um, the rotating shelter rest that we have in Marin, which was a temporary response um, to meeting more shelter beds that was started 10 years ago. Um, again, it's a temporary response and um, really best practices have changed in the last 10 years. Um, the idea of sheltering people for 10 years straight is actually not a healthy response to homelessness in your community. Um, the, uh, the facts are that a person living on the street is not likely to die because of weather or hypothermia. The odds are much higher that people die because they're homeless year after year after year and they're not getting the medical treatment that they need. So they, just, they die from heart disease, they die from diabetes and other curable, in many cases, diseases that aren't being addressed while they're challenged day after day after day just to survive. And so our model as a community is changing. It's, we don't want to see the same person 10 years in a row and say, oh, there's Jim, he's such a nice guy, right? Well, he's still out on the street and he's gonna die out on that street unless we do the systems that we're doing now. So everyone who's in the rotating shelter is getting that VI spadat. They're getting rated for their vulnerability and they're getting a direct intervention that's appropriate to their place, what they need, because we wanna get people housed. We no longer wanna say, we'll give you I mean, this is what rest was. It was sleeping on a church floor at night. That is not a community response to homelessness. It's just not. It's better than nothing, but we want to do a whole lot better than better than nothing. So that's why that's changing. We're changing the way we do the entire shelter system in Marin um, through Homeward Bound. So everything is going to be about uh, housing and shelter programs that have the best results are actually called housing focused shelter. So every minute that you spend in that shelter is spent helping you figure out how to get housing. Um, and so the shelter, we're hoping that the shelter system will be open during the day, that's the best practice. In the past, it's not been closed during the day so that people are just out there trying to struggle until they can get a bed again at night. No progress is being able to be made. By staying open, which is our goal with Homeward Bound, people will be working with a housing focused case manager to help them find housing. And as an example, in a shelter system that works that way at night, the case, the case managers that are awake at night, okay, because it's a 24 hour shelter, they spend the evening on Craigslist scaling every housing opportunity out there so that when shelter participants wake up in the morning, they're faced with, okay, who are we gonna call? Where are we gonna go? how are we gonna get you housed? So it's a different model, and it's change is scary for sure, um, but we feel like this is the best model going forward. That was a long answer, sorry. And St. Vincent's runs rest, so I mean, this is something that we're very passionate about, is doing it better and doing it right. And we have the congregations in general um, support because those congregations, those volunteers, are so committed and they're so educated and they're so on top of what best practices are that um, the vast majority of folks feel very much the same way and want to know how they can help participate in this new system. And we end up 
Okay, the end of rest does not mean the end of emergency shelter in Marin. The county does fund um, three emergency shelters here. We fund the New Beginning Center in Nevada, Mill Street uh, in San Rafael, and we also fund the um, Center for Domestic Peace Domestic Violence Shelter. So those shelter beds will continue to exist. There will be places for people to go. And like Christine said, uh, St. Vincent de Paul and Homer Bound are working closely together to make sure that the beds that are available are um, more focused on housing, which will help uh, more people move through the system so that there's not a, such a backlog of folks stuck in shelter uh, year after year. So uh, we found, uh, oh, our, our question is, so if we manage to house successfully everybody who's homeless here in Marin, what do we do with the new folks who come in from other communities? Um, and the answer is that in just about every community I've ever worked in, and it's true here too, 70 to 75 percent of the people who are experiencing homelessness really became homeless in our community. Um, that number is pretty stable. It uh, seems the same in any community, regardless of um, that community's uh, uh, affluence, regardless of the services that are available in that community. It's you know 70, roughly 70, 75 percent in San Francisco and also in Mariposa County. Um, so it's it really is a fairly stable number across the board. So we do know we have some people who come in, who come out, um, but that's just like people who were housed also. I'm not a Marine native, I moved here three years ago. Uh, and uh, we, we see the same thing with people who are homeless. And, by and large, I think most of our providers would agree with this, that more people who are homeless are actually moving out of county than who are, are moving into county because it's expensive to be housed here. So we're housing people um, across the, the region where it's a little bit more affordable. Um, and I'll let Christine speak, but we do have programs to connect people back to um, family and friends in other places. Um, and then we do have a small population of folks who are moving through, um, who are, you know, particularly the younger crowd of people um, who are you know, having a little bit of a Jack Kerouac existence. Um, <laughs> <laughs> moving on through up the coast to, to Humboldt um, and really not settling in any one place. Um, well, quickly, uh, again, because we're monitoring other communities um, that are doing this exact same work, the communities that are functional zero or close to it have reported that that has not happened. So they, they found the cure, they're working in the community, they don't have droves of people moving in and saying, okay, I'm going to be housed next. And really the profile of people who are chronically homeless is that they tend to stay where they are. That's again, that's rigorously researched numbers that people tend to stay where they know they can be where they know they can sleep safely under, you know, under this doorway in this town, and these are their friends, and this is their group, and there's where they take their shower. So generally, they're not that transitory, except for what Ashley said, the younger people. That um, I found out that we have a lot of people that want to go to Terrapin Crossroads and like hang out with the dead. <laughs> so. Um, that's another group that I didn't even know about, but the young people coming through town, a lot of them are actually there for that experience. They come, they stay for a little while, and they leave, and those aren't the people that we see as chronic Yeah, I would just add one final thing more generally, which is that um, the city of San Rafael, the county, St. Vincent's, Homeward Bound, Ritter Center, and the Housing Authority are all involved in something called um, Community Solutions, the Build for Zero campaign. And so this is basically a national effort to get communities across the country using this coordinated entry model. And so it's not only cities and towns in, in California, but it's you know my hometown is in Virginia, it's <coughs> Madison, Wisconsin, it's the Mississippi Delta. I mean, this is a national issue. It's not just unique to California. And so I think really for us, the more communities that are using this process, I think we all benefit. And so it's about regional coordination, state coordination, and really this is national coordination, um, which has been you know, really fantastic. So I think that's really key. And then the final thing is, just even in the Bay Area, I think Christine alluded to it in her presentation, but, you know, we borrowed best practices from Sonoma, from Alameda County, from San Francisco, from Santa Clara County, and they're doing the same for us. So I feel like in a lot of ways, we've actually, because we're smaller, we've kind of 
leapfrog, honestly, close to the front of the path in terms of really doing innovative things. And so I think the more that we're collaborating and all the communities are effectively addressing this issue, we're not going to have a lot of that, that transaction. So. The women are at the Health and Wellness Campus, which is a county program. So they don't travel with the men, but we do have room for women at rest. It's, it's a male and female program. Nevertheless, some women do report a sense that they are not safe in, in those circumstances. And I thought I could tell. Oh, absolutely. And also, just so you know, the men aren't safe either. So the, it goes in all directions, in all ways, and it's one of the biggest tragedies of homelessness, incredibly sad. And again, all those women are getting the services um, that they need to. It is really hard. From what we see, women who become chronically homeless are the ones with really the highest mental health needs. No woman wants to become homeless. Um, they, they generally depend on family and friends. They'll live anywhere. They'll do anything rather than become homeless. So the women that we see that are homeless, they are very, very high needs and they need a lot of help and we are absolutely there at doing that work. And, and those are people that are getting on the highest end of our coordinated entry system and some have been housed already and more will be housed. Thank you, again, I appreciate everything that you've done and I like what you have presented. Um, my question um, segues from hers about the women. And in the bottle, for instance, at the post office, every year we get women with their children begging. And you know, like they're evicted, they want money. It's, are there any programs that helps women? Then we have a couple of women with their um, shopping carts hanging out around the post office. So it's like, what can we do uh, to help? It, it bothers me when I see children with their mother's baby. So our, our system, of, we do have programs for uh, families with children. Um, we have, our system is really divided into programs for individuals, for single adults. Uh, and uh, programs for families. So most of what we talked about today was our system for um, single adults. That's really most of the population we're talking about, but we do have some of those families who are very high need and we do have permanent supportive housing available for them um, and they're being assigned to, um, uh, through coordinated entry just like the individuals are. Um, and in addition, we do have the, the county funds and we also have state funds and um, uh, also some local philanthropy dollars for uh, rapid rehousing. Um, St. Vincent Paul is one of the agencies that, that runs that for families, uh, and that's short-term rental assistance paired with some case management. So for families who are uh, a little bit less high need um, than some of the folks that we're talking about here, we do have uh, resources for them. And I know you've got a lot to say about families. Well, yeah, I have a lot to say about families um, going to churches, and post office and in front of Trader Joe's with their children. Um, I would say the first thing you should do is give them the phone number of your local Catholic church because we house tons of people that way. But I would also say we know a lot of those folks and they aren't homeless. So be really, 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 really careful um, about who you are trying to help or who you get hooked into because we do have a roving band of families that show up at, at at least our Catholic churches, I'm sure other places too, and they do have their story, but when we try to help them with practical things that don't involve cash, um, they're not interested, and we try. So, and I know I'm gonna let you spend this time talking about panhandling. <laughs> yes, so um, the city about a year ago rolled out a program called Put Your Change to Work, which uh, if you've seen the Purple Meters in downtown San Rafael, the idea is that we're really trying to educate the community, like Christine's saying, that it's much better to give inside to programs and organizations where you know where the money is going versus on the street. Um, so that program was in partnership with the downtown streets team in the downtown. 
we are rolling out this month new signage. Um, it's going to go out throughout the city that uh, is fantastic looking at um, St. Vincent's and Homer Bound and the Streets team and Ritter all agreed to put their logos on there to really endorse that this is um, you know, the better way to think about the issue. Because I really think for us, and, and especially the city, is unfortunately for a lot of folks in our community, in fact thousands of people, you know, they drive down 3rd Street every day and they get up from 101 and they're going to work. And so their sole interaction with this issue is someone panhandling along 3rd. And as you heard, there's a ton of things. I mean, we didn't even I think we touched the tip of the iceberg in terms of everything we're doing. So it's really frustrating for us that for a lot of people, that's their only interaction. So, but when you talk to people that are panhandling, uh, they tell you they continue to do it because they continue to get money. So it really is an economic issue. And um, you know, this, the city and other communities, you can't legislate against panhandling. It's been a First Amendment right for people to do that. So it really comes down to, I think, behavior change in the community. So the police department talks to these folks, and um, the last report was the guy that's making $60 an hour on the street, panhandling from all of you. So that's a really high-paying job. We're going to quit our jobs and <laughs> get a sign. Um, so just keep that in mind when you see panhandlers. If they truly need help, first of all, St. Vincent's open every single day of the year, every single day since 1981, and we'll give you a hot breakfast, a hot lunch, and a takeaway meal. So when people say they're hungry, Send them to us, and the chances are the person with the sign is going to say, uh, I, don't, I don't need to go there. It's not what they're looking for. So I always just don't get scammed, you know. And there's so many ways that you can truly help people, but that one-on-one -on -one thing is really not the best way. I, I just want to add, I'm, I'm like the classic biggest bleeding heart liberal possible. I, I, I see, I, I, I get that feeling, that like that visceral like, heart tug when you see the kids out there banging. It's, it's, it's really tough, um, but at least for our community, I, I can't speak to other communities, but at least in our community, we've shifted our system of care so entirely that people who people who may in the past um, have been too high needs for our programs and they kicked out of programs left and right and have no resources left and so they're left begging on the streets, that's not the situation here in Marin anymore. Um, those high needs people, we're not leaving them behind. If we can't get them into housing, we're continuing to engage them. We've got outreach workers focused on them. We're trying to build trust. We're doing everything we can to bring in those high needs people so that nobody is left behind. It is wonderful. It is wonderful to hear what you're doing. It's truly a continuum of care. Um, Basic human needs all the way through treatment and and um, to iron out the herd of cats that was once the situation that we're in is a damn miracle. <laughs> um, I respect you guys and admire you guys a lot. As you know, I'm a fierce housing advocate. So landed. And not a week goes on that I don't get a request for I read Craigslist. If nothing else, I see the competitive rates are. They're very high. Landlords are making things. And there are fierce resistance to basically providing for relief. We can't hear anything. So, right, so the, the question is, housing is um, amazingly expensive here in Marin. There's not enough uh, housing. And where in the world are we actually housing people? How are we finding that housing? Um, and this is actually something we're really excited about. Um, it's, we're having a problem now that I never, um, never in a million years would have expected a couple of years ago, um, where we actually have more housing units available for moving, then we have people who have their documents in order to go into those units. Um, yeah, we're, we're finding units faster than we can put people in them. The Marin Housing Authority, and HHS is funding a housing locator position at Marin Housing Authority. Um, and that uh, so typically um, 
it's you, it's case managers who are doing housing searches for people. You're working with your person, and you get online, you look at Craigslist, and you call landlords, and these are social workers. Uh, they are not real estate people, but the person at Murray Housing, she's she speaks landlord. Uh, she's got a long history of real estate experience here in Marin, um, and she says things that um, you, you definitely would not hear a social worker say. For some reason, landlords really like it, um, and they respect her, and we've gotten, um, I don't know, do you guys remember how many landlords to? 82. 82, yeah, new landlords, new landlords um, as a part of her work. Um, so she's, she's working with uh, everybody who's coming through coordinated entry. Um, she's helping find units for all of these folks. Um, and we're, we're able to give people at least some kind of choice in their units, whether they want to live in Nevada or San Rafael. Or, um, she's, she's amazing, and she's totally changed our system. It's a best practice um, that we pulled from other communities, and it's working super well here. But not everybody can take advantage of, of those kinds of programs. A lot of the folks that we're talking about, those really high needs, people who are being housed at the top of our coordinated entry list, may not actually ever be able to go through a program like that. But the good news is that our permanent supportive housing vouchers um, take their income into account. So if you have zero income, you pay zero dollars. Um, if you have you know, thirty dollars of income um, per month, you pay ten dollars. Um, it's it's really. Um, very minimal for people who are really about the highest needs, so you don't have to find a job if you really are not going to be able to. On the other hand, as people start to stabilize and really want more engagement in the world, absolutely we offer those services, and that's fantastic that they're there. Hi, I'm Justin Jones. I'm the Kids are being kicked out 
um, but there's no services in that way that can help him. There's no outreach. I mean, there's the mobile crisis team and everything, but but everything is really past. You know, getting him there at that moment is key. So I was just wondering if you could um, respond to that if you thought about an in-house team that would actually prevent these if you've got ties from ever becoming housing, from you know, homeless again. I think there's several angles to what you just said, and I definitely I want Christine to talk about homeless prevention, um, particularly. But the um, just to clarify, the, the folks that were housing <coughs> permanent supportive housing, the support part of permanent supportive housing are the things that will will keep them from becoming homeless ever again. We've made a commitment as a community to keeping people from falling out of permanent supportive housing. So if somebody is really struggling in the unit that they've been placed in. Um, we come together as a coordinated entry team and find another unit for them um, so that people are not being evicted uh, from housing once they've been placed. Um, and then the other thing is that uh, whole person care, uh, part of um, what that program is, is doing, it's housing-based case management, but also um, medical case management. And the, there's a single case plan for somebody that, that the medical case manager and the housing case manager are both using they can see, the housing case manager can see if somebody's medication has shifted um, and uh, watch that and be pay close attention and they can communicate with the medical case manager or with the, the doctors if something starts to go wrong. So there are those supports starting to become available. On that. In addition, in terms of preventing homelessness, which is what all of us want, um, St. Vincent's does have a program that we've been running since 1946 in Marin, and that's called Home Visits. It's for homelessness prevention. If you know anyone that's going to lose their housing, they're going to get an eviction notice, or they're staring at one, um, oftentimes that happens because someone's hours at work were cut back temporarily, or someone got sick, or there's a divorce, and all of a sudden landlord's knocking on the door, and you don't have your rent that month, please call St. Vincent. So you can call our line, you can look it up. Um, in San Rafael, or again, call your local Catholic church because we have home visit volunteers in every single city and town in Marin. We do about 1,400 home visits a year in Marin to people under those circumstances, help about 2,800 people, and a third of those people are children under the age of 18. So we have a lot of families that are living on the edge, and our volunteers go to their home, two volunteers at a time, day, night, weekend, holiday, whatever works best for that family, and helps them self solve that temporary crisis. If it's a long-term crisis, like you literally cannot afford your rent anymore, then they will help you look for a new place to live, pay your moving costs, and pay your rental deposit for your new, more affordable place. So we don't want anyone to become homeless. We're working really hard at getting homeless people out in housing, so we don't want one more person to become that statistic. So um, we spend almost a million dollars a year doing that, um, and that's the program that we do because we have amazing volunteers and very charitable donors that help make that happen. So, and you don't have to be Catholic; it's nothing to do with that, <laughs> not at all. You can be anybody. And then one final thing, just I think for the group, I know you all are very, you know, your stuff around this issue. I would just tell the group because it's something that I didn't fully appreciate till this role is that a lot of the mental health policy specifically in, in California is really at a state level. So we've had a very unique opportunity with the HOT team to really deep dive some of these issues. And we've really found that in some cases there just simply are not enough beds for people that need long-term assistance. Um, some people obviously are not uh, open to treatment and, and you know treatment's a choice uh, at this point. Um, for the vast majority of people, even when they're severely, gravely disabled, um, and then, you know, I think again, I was mentioned earlier, I think Ashley said this, but you know, what Medicaid is paying for, if it can pay for housing, if it can, I, my understanding is I think it gets cut, cut off when people get into custody. So for people that are going in and out of the jail because of their behavior, they're losing their health insurance and they can't continue their treatment, it's a real problem. So I think, you know, really there's things that we can do locally, but not losing the focus at a state level that there's still a lot more that we need to do for, for mental health. Any question over here? I'm interested in the population of homeless. Uh, we had 701, or in the June, 458, I think it was. Uh, what is the fluctuation over the years, over the last 20 years of the homeless? Uh, is it a steady climb, or is it a steady decline, or is it a fixed and 
bell. Um, so it, it's kind of a, a moving target, unfortunately. I, I think part of it is just the methodology we use. So the way it, we count is that every odd year in January, the federal government requires that communities go out and count everyone that's homeless at that point in time. So it's really sort of a function of how well that count is done and that methodology is done. I think now we have our methodology dialed in pretty well. Uh, it's still a matter of execution, but, um, but to give you the kind of general picture of Marin, uh, our current number in 2017 was there were about 1,100 people that were experiencing homelessness. 1,100, 1,100 total. Um, of that, about 700, as I mentioned, are unsheltered. So they're not in programs, they're not in shelter, they're not in transitional housing, so they're, they're actually on the street. And then of the 1,100, about 360 of those folks are chronically homeless. So those are the, the long-term um, And how people. does that compare over a 20-year period? Uh, over a 20-year period, I, I don't know that. I would say since 2008, there was a major uptick, obviously. Um, but I don't know if you have numbers on that. Yeah. So they don't, they don't, our numbers don't go back that far. So that's part of the problem. And because our methodology has shifted, um, it, if you look at the 2013 count compared to the 2015 count, it looks like there was a 40% increase. But it, it, so the number of people we counted between 2013 and 2015 went up by 40%. 40%. But that does not reflect an actual change in the number of people who were homeless. It's just the number of people we counted. Mm -hmm. Our methodology changed pretty radically, um, and we discovered we were not capturing a huge number of people who were experiencing homelessness. So um, I think over quite a long period of time, based on provider reports, our, our number has been fairly constant. Um, 1,100 is Pretty, pretty constant. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So fairly constant. Um, and then at nationwide, numbers are actually starting to go down. On average, um, in this last count cycle, things went up a little bit, but only because of increases in uh, high income areas like uh, San, San Francisco and Los Angeles and New York. But nationwide, um, count numbers are really going down, and particularly among veterans. Um, veteran counts are really just tanking, which is amazing. There's been so many resources poured into veteran homelessness. It's being ended in community after community. I just wanted to add one thing too. I, to me, I think sometimes what the point in time count misses is, is that flow throughout time. So there was a study recently through the University of Chicago that looked at youth homelessness. So I think it was people that were 15 to 25. And so according to the point in time count, if you ask how many homeless youth are there in the country, number was around 40 to 50,000 people that were homeless in that point in time. Um, but this University of Chicago study looked at that same year, over the course of a year, and found that over four million youth in this country experienced homelessness at some point over the year. So it speaks to this interesting dynamic where a lot of people kind of self-resolve and they experience it for you know, a couple weeks and then they get out of it, but they might experience it again. But it, it really speaks to that there are these much bigger upstream issues that are driving people to the street that it's not fully captured in the point in time now. I maybe make a comment. I was on the Homeless Winter Shelter Committee 28 years ago, and that shelter was just filled every night. I think the population was not nearly as high, but the services that you provided are so much better. I just wanted say that I found this very, very exciting. <coughs> and the homeless population that I'm acquainted with is in the North Mission in San Francisco, the corner of 15th Street and <coughs> between Mission and Valencia has um, an encampment outside our church. And we have about 60 a night sleeping on the floor. Um, with one bathroom only and no shower, I, I think we need to do something more. And I'm wondering if Jeff, um, Jeff, Jeff Kozitsky, I think he's the uh, homeless czar for San Francisco. I wonder if you've spoken with him, if he's acquainted with what you're doing. <laughs> Well, I, I know that he, um, I, I've met him at least, I mean, I think he, he's actively trying to implement coordinated entry there as well. You can just imagine though that the scale of the issue is about 10 times larger at least. And so for us, I think what's been kind of a, a beautiful thing is that we have 
uh, a relatively small number of providers. So if we can come together as a team pretty easily, we've now implemented releases of information so we can talk to each other more easily. I think our technology's in a better place. So he's basically trying to do all of that, but I think, you know, again, times 10, the number of people that are involved and the layers of bureaucracy. So it's a challenge for sure. One thing that I think is really promising though that I, I'm pretty sure that the city of San Francisco is doing and um, the county of Los Angeles is moving towards though, is creating a local housing voucher pool. So right now we were talking earlier about recruiting landlords and we're in housing authority. We have about 2,000 vouchers in, in our community that people can use for, for rental assistance. That number is capped by HUD, so the Department of Housing and Urban Development. So I think most people in this room would probably agree the current administration is putting some challenges in place. So across the country, uh, there's been a, a budget cut for every housing authority in the country. So communities have fewer federally funded vouchers that they can use to house people. And so I think other communities are having more success, for example, going to let's say a Marin General, and we say, look, like the, the graph that we showed you earlier, you know, hey, Bob's not coming in as often as he was, that's saving you a ton of money, why don't you invest $3 million in our local housing voucher pool, and then we can use those vouchers and coordinated entry, uh, and then it's having that conversation with the criminal justice system and you know, philanthropic partners, so I think that's something that would be really awesome here, and I think it's something that he's trying to do there, uh, and, and he got a bunch of money through Tipping Point, uh, I think it was $100 million to implement uh, that, so. so anyway. How can I help bring what you're doing to my corner in San Francisco? <laughs> have someone call us. That's what I would say. Call, have them call Andrew Henning. That's <laughs> <laughs> fine. Um, but we do take our show to the other counties and we've learned so much from other counties and, and their best practices and we're always happy to bring our best practices to others and for example we went to Berkeley uh, not too long ago to learn their best practice and it was like it was a big whoops moment when we realized we were head and shoulders above where they are and it was pretty scary and their issue is their uh, elected officials just aren't on board with current practices and their housing authority is not at the table. Well, you know, God bless them, Red Housing Authority, because they are a really important partner and totally committed to ending homelessness in Marin, and we couldn't do it without them. And in Berkeley, it's like, no, I'm not gonna come to your meetings, and you're not gonna come to my meetings, and no public officials are saying, you need to go to each other's meetings, right? And so they're, they're, they're way behind, and it, and it shows. So, if there's anyone who wants to talk to us, we're always happy to share what has worked. I'll just add two small things, one of which is that, um, yes, I want to absolutely second and third and fourth what Christine said about the Housing Authority. We could not, could I repeat, could not do anything that we're doing here without the Housing Authority's cooperation. The, the new vouchers that we're um, implementing, the Housing Authority came to us and said, we'd like to designate some of these vouchers to people who are experiencing chronic homelessness. Um, they're running our coordinated entry program. I mean, it's just, they've been, they've been amazing. Um, and the, the other thing is uh, that we have, I think we actually have things that we can learn from San Francisco as well. One of the field trips we took was to visit um, some of their very low barrier shelter, which is something that they have um, that we don't. So I think there's, there's a lot of learning across um, county lines that can happen there. Hi, I wanna say um, just for the education of the audience, but um, for the last 11 years, some mental health advocates, primarily family members, have been trying to get what's called Laura's Law in place here in this county, and it's still not implemented. And what it is for the audience's information is it's utilizing the, um, the court system to get people who are perhaps maybe paranoid schizophrenics who do not willingly sign up for um, services because they're afraid, they think people are trying to kill them. So why would you sign up for services? Uh, anyway, this has not been implemented. We're looking now forward to our new director of behavioral health, who may, I uh, think we're hoping against hope, because this is exactly one of the last little, what would you call it, little bits of a piece of the puzzle that will get people off the streets. For example, there is a man who is only 47 years old, but looks like he's 74. 
City on, on 3rd Street in Tamalpais, hiding behind um, uh, the uh, mailbox uh, thing that's there, or just sitting on the street and spend a day after day after day. And I know people have talked to him, but he is not going to sign up for services because <clears throat> he doesn't feel safe. So if you could address what you plan to do about people like this. Do all of you know the man that I, I'm talking about? Have you seen him? Yeah. Um, and he doesn't think he's sick. He just wants to sit there on Third Street. So he is deteriorating. I know, I've known this man for a long time. He is a, he's a Novato native, and he um, is certainly deserving of services. And uh, But anyway, I'd like to hear what you might have to say about how you address people like that um, with outdoors law and then with Laura's law. Well, I think um, we're, none of us are experts in Laura's law, so, so the answering exactly what we would do under Laura's law, I don't, it's probably a little beyond our scope here. We do have a new director of behavioral health at Health and Human Services who just started a few days ago. Um, and he came from San Mateo County and I think he's just gonna be fabulous. Um, so that's exciting. I'm sure you'll hear from him at some point. Um, the gentleman that uh, Barbara was speaking about is somebody who's absolutely on our radars. Um, we're not, we have some, we can't share information about him, but um, we're not giving up. That's exactly the sort of person that we're talking about when we say we're working to make sure nobody gets left behind. Um, you guys want to Yeah, I mean, I, I would just add again, operationally, it, it's a real challenge, and I think this is, again, one of the, the, the elements at the state level that really is a challenge for local jurisdictions. So we, the city of San Rafael, funds a mental health resource officer through our police department. Her name's Lynn Murphy. She's downtown every single day doing outreach to folks in the homeless community. And I've been with her on many occasions when we've talked to this gentleman and we've offered him to go into the shelter. We've offered to talk about housing. We've offered to help with uh, motel stays, healthcare services, and he just doesn't want them. He, he, he turns them down. Uh, and this is a challenge that plays out for many, many individuals that uh, unfortunately they don't, like you said, um, realize they're ill. I mean, it's actually, if you can imagine a symptom of the condition to not even be able to recognize that in yourself. So um, it, it's a huge challenge. I do know that um, if you search um, KQED Forum, if you know the program, um, Scott Wiener in San Francisco, um, who's uh, I guess a state senator at this point, he's introduced new legislation at a state level to re-examine the conservatorship laws in California. So part of the challenge that we find is that um, right now, if let's say I had a psychotic break and then I was committed because I was a danger to myself or others, if I clear up in, um, let's say, in the crisis stabilization unit, if I take medication, I take a shower, I have a good meal, and then I go see a judge 24 hours later while I'm doing okay now, I would be released back to the street. And so for some people, this, I'm not exaggerating, this happens a hundred, like will happen a hundred times. Yeah, so these people are literally just dying on our street. And so I think what um, Senator Wiener is trying to achieve is basically allowing jurisdictions to look into people's history or to look at you know, service attempts in the past, do longer holds so that people can receive services for longer. Um, so that's something that's been presented. I, I, you know, again, I don't know the particulars on that, but um, of the legislation, but I think that kind of idea has some merit. Well, this is, may I just, this is where Laura's Law, which is court-ordered assisted outpatient treatment, would help you guys get him in, because a mental health uh, clinician would go out with you to the street, assess him, and boom, boom, he's in the hospital. And before he leaves that hospital, once he's stabilized or she's stabilized, they will go before a judge. Most of the time, they don't need to be court ordered because they don't like the back room fit. And so then, boom, they're in a mental health system and can get housing for a minimal of six months. It's wraparound services. We're just waiting, the supervisors passed it last year, we're waiting for it to be implemented, which trust me, you will love it when it is. You won't have to keep going back 10 times. I was so, at that meeting when it was passed. I had no idea it was not in place. Not, it's supposed to be implemented in June, and we hope that it is, because yeah. we're not a That's, that's a shame. We're not supposed to implement it last year. We're hoping for this year. But it will definitely benefit the guys' jobs immensely. OK. Well, I think we've run out of time. I want to thank Andrew Henney, Christine Paquette,
Ashley Hart McIntyre for an extraordinary exchange of ideas. Thank all of you for your input as well. Uh, we do have to wrap up, but let's thank our speakers.